then those articles will never go to your enemies. Why do you think the king was interested in encouraging trade? Which groups of people would have benefited from these transactions? Yavana is a Sanskrit word used for the Greeks and other peoples who entered the subcontinent from the northwest. Amara is believed to be derived from the Sanskrit word Samara, meaning battle, or war. It also resembles the Persian term Amir, meaning a high noble. Finding out about the city A large number of inscriptions of the kings of Vijayanagara and their Nayakas recording donations to temples as well as describing important events have been recovered. Several travelers visited the city and wrote about it. Notable among their accounts are those of an Italian trader named Niccolo da Conti, an ambassador named Abdur Rizik sent by the ruler of Persia, a merchant named Afanasii Nikitin from Russia, all of whom visited the city in the 15th century, and those of Duarte Barbosa, Domingo Pace, and Fernão Nunes from Portugal, who came in the 16th century. Would you find these features in a city today? Why do you think the gardens and water bodies were selected for special mention by Pace? Source 3. A Sprawling City. This is an excerpt from Domingo Peace description of Vijayanagara. The size of this city I do not write here, because it cannot all be seen from any one spot, but I climbed a hill whence I could see a great part of it, I could not see it all because it lies between several ranges of hills. What I saw from thence seemed to me as large as Rome, and very beautiful to the sight, there are many groves of trees within it, in the gardens of the houses, and many conduits of water which flow into the midst of it, and in places there are lakes, and the king has close to his palace a palm grove and other rich fruit-bearing trees. Source 4. How Tanks Were Built About a tank constructed by Krishna Devaraya, Pays wrote. The king made a tank, at the mouth of two hills so that all the water which comes from either one side or the other collects there, and, besides this, water comes to it from more than three leagues, approximately 15 kilometers, by pipes which run along the lower parts of the range outside. This water is brought from a lake which itself overflows into a little river. The tank has three large pillars handsomely carved with figures, these connect above with certain pipes by which they get water when they have to irrigate their gardens and rice fields. In order to make this tank the said king broke down a hill. In the tank I saw so many people at work that there must have been 15 or 20 thousand men, looking like ants. A house of victory? This is what Pays had to say about the audience hall and the Mahanavamaya Dibba, which together he called the house of victory. These buildings have two platforms one above the other, beautifully sculpted. On the upper platform, in this house of victory the king has a room made of cloth, where the idol has a shrine and in the other in the middle is placed a dais on which stands a throne of state, the crown and the royal anklet. Source 5. The Bazaar. Pays gives a vivid description of the bazaar. Going forward, you have a broad and beautiful street. In this street live many merchants, and there you will find all sorts of rubies and diamonds and emeralds and pearls and seed pearls and cloths and every other sort of thing there is on earth and that you may wish to buy. Then you have there every evening a fair where they sell many common horses and nags, and also many citrons and limes and oranges, and grapes, and every other kind of garden stuff, and wood, you have all in this street. More generally, he described the city as being the best provided city in the world with the markets stocked with provisions such as rice, wheat, grains, India corn, and a certain amount of barley and beans, mung pulses and horse gram all of which were cheaply and abundantly available. According to Fernão Nunes, the Vijayanagaram markets were overflowing with abundance of fruits, grapes and oranges, limes, pomegranates, jackfruit and mangoes and all very cheap. Meat too was sold in abundance in the marketplaces. Nunes describes mutton, pork, venison, partridges, hares, doves, quail and all kinds of birds, sparrows, rats and cats and lizards as being sold in the market of Basnaga. Vijayanagara. Krishnadevaraya. To recapitulate about some of the problems of perspective, look at this beautiful statue of Krishnadevaraya placed on the Gopuram of the temple at Jadambaram, Tamil Nadu. This is obviously the way in which the ruler wanted to project himself. 
And this is how Pays describes the king. Of medium height, and of fair complexion and good figure, rather fat than thin, he has on his face signs of smallpox. Theme 8. Peasants, Zamindars, and the State. Agrarian Society and the Mughal Empire. C. 16th-17th centuries. During the 16th and 17th centuries about 85 percent of the population of India lived in its villages. Both peasants and landed elites were involved in agricultural production and claimed rights to a share of the produce. This created relationships of cooperation, competition, and conflict among them. The sum of these agrarian relationships made up rural society. At the same time agencies from outside also entered into the rural world. Most important among these was the Mughal state, which derived the bulk of its income from agricultural production. Agents of the state revenue assessors, collectors, record keepers sought to control rural society so as to ensure that cultivation took place and the state got its regular share of taxes from the produce. Since many crops were grown for sale, trade, money, and markets entered the villages and linked the agricultural areas with the towns. 1. Peasants and Agricultural Production The basic unit of agricultural society was the village, inhabited by peasants who performed the manifold seasonal tasks that made up agricultural production throughout the year tilling the soil, sowing seeds, harvesting the crop when it was ripe. Further, they contributed their labor to the production of agro-based goods such as sugar and oil. But rural India was not characterized by settled peasant production alone. Several kinds of areas such as large tracts of dry land or hilly regions were not cultivable in the same way as the more fertile expanses of land. In addition, forest areas made up a substantial proportion of territory. We need to keep this varied topography in mind when discussing agrarian society. 1.1 Looking for Sources Our understanding of the workings of rural society does not come from those who worked the land, as peasants did not write about themselves. Our major source for the agrarian history of the 16th and early 17th centuries are chronicles and documents from the Mughal court. One of the most important chronicles was the Aini Akbari, in short the An, authored by Akbar's court historian Abu al Fazl. This text meticulously recorded the arrangements made by the state to ensure cultivation, to enable the collection of revenue by the agencies of the state, and to regulate the relationship between the state and rural magnates, the Zamindars. The central purpose of the An was to present a vision of Akbar's empire where social harmony was provided by a strong ruling class. Any revolt or assertion of autonomous power against the Mughal state was, in the eyes of the author of the An, predestined to fail. In other words, whatever we learn from the An about peasants remains a view from the top. Fortunately, however, the account of the An can be supplemented by descriptions contained in sources emanating from regions away from the Mughal capital. These include detailed revenue records from Gujarat, Maharashtra, and Rajasthan dating from the 17th and 18th centuries. Further, the extensive records of the East India Company provide us with useful descriptions of agrarian relations in eastern India. All these sources record instances of conflicts between in the process they give us an insight into peasants' perception of and their expectations of fairness from the state. 1.2 Peasants and their lands The term which Indo-Persian sources of the Mughal period most frequently used to denote a peasant was rayat, plural, rayaya, or musarayan. In addition, we also encounter the terms kisan or asami. Sources of the 17th century refer to two kinds of peasants kudkashta and pahakashta. The former were residents of the village in which they held their lands. The latter were non-resident cultivators who belonged to some other village, but cultivated lands elsewhere on a contractual basis. People became Pahakashta either out of choice for example, when terms of revenue in a distant village were more favorable or out of compulsion for example, forced by economic distress after a famine. Seldom did the average peasant of North India possess more than a pair of bullocks and two plows, most possessed even less. In Gujarat peasants possessing about six acres of land were considered to be affluent, in Bengal, on the other hand, five acres was the upper limit of an average peasant farm, ten acres would make one a rich Assami. Cultivation was based on the principle of individual ownership. 
Peasant lands were bought and sold in the same way as the lands of other property owners. This 19th century description of peasant holdings in the Deliagra region would apply equally to the 17th century. The cultivating peasants, Assamis, who plow up the fields, mark the limits of each field, for identification and demarcation, with borders of, raised, earth, brick and thorns so that thousands of such fields may be counted in a village. 1.3 Irrigation and Technology The abundance of land, available labor, and the mobility of peasants were three factors that accounted for the constant expansion of agriculture. Since the primary purpose of agriculture is to feed people, basic staples such as rice, wheat, or millets were the most frequently cultivated crops. Areas which received 40 inches or more of rainfall a year were generally rice-producing zones, followed by wheat and millets, corresponding to a descending scale of precipitation. Monsoons remained the backbone of Indian agriculture, as they are even today. But there were crops which required additional water. Artificial systems of irrigation had to be devised for this. Irrigation projects received state support as well. For example, in northern India the state undertook digging of new canals, Nair, Nala, and also repaired old ones like the Shanar in the Punjab during Shah Jahan's reign. Though agriculture was labor-intensive, peasants did use technologies that often harnessed cattle energy. One example was the wooden plow, which was light and easily assembled with an iron tip or coulter. It therefore did not make deep furrows, which preserved the moisture better during the intensely hot months. A drill, pulled by a pair of giant oxen, was used to plant seeds, but broadcasting of seed was the most prevalent method. Hoeing and weeding were done simultaneously using a narrow iron blade with a small wooden handle. 1.4 An abundance of crops. Agriculture was organized around two major seasonal cycles, the Karif, autumn, and the Rubi, spring. This would mean that most regions, except those terrains that were the most arid or inhospitable, produced a minimum of two crops a year, Dufisla, whereas some, where rainfall or irrigation assured a continuous supply of water, even gave three crops. This ensured an enormous variety of produce. For instance, we are told in the end that the Mughal provinces of Agra produced 39 varieties of crops and Delhi produced 43 over the two seasons. Bengal produced 50 varieties of rice alone. However, the focus on the cultivation of basic staples did not mean that agriculture in medieval India was only for subsistence. We often come across the term Jansi camel, literally, perfect crops, in our sources. The Mughal state also encouraged peasants to cultivate such crops as they brought in more revenue. Crops such as cotton and sugarcane were Jansi camel par excellence. Cotton was grown over a great swathe of territory spread over central India and the Deccan Plateau, whereas Bengal was famous for its sugar. Such cash crops would also include various sorts of oil seeds, for example, mustard and lentils. This shows how subsistence and commercial production were closely intertwined in an average peasant's holding. During the 17th century several new crops from different parts of the world reached the Indian subcontinent. Maize, maca, for example, was introduced into India via Africa and Spain and by the 17th century it was being listed as one of the major crops of western India. Vegetables like tomatoes, potatoes and chilies were introduced from the New World at this time, as were fruits like the pineapple and the papaya. 2. The village community. The above account makes it clear that agricultural production involved the intensive participation and initiative of the peasantry. How did this affect the structure of agrarian relations in Mughal society? To find out, let us look at the social groups involved in agricultural expansion, and at their relationships and conflicts. We have seen that peasants held their lands in individual ownership. At the same time they belonged to a collective village community as far as many aspects of their social existence were concerned. There were three constituents of this community the cultivators, the panchayat, and the village headman. Mukadam or Mandal. 2.1 Caste and the Rural Milieu. Deep inequities on the basis of caste and other caste like distinctions meant that the cultivators were a highly heterogeneous group. Among those who tilled the land, 
there was a sizable number who worked as menials or agricultural laborers, major. Despite the abundance of cultivable land, certain caste groups were assigned menial tasks and thus relegated to poverty. Though there was no census at that time, the little data that we have suggest that such groups comprised a large section of the village population, had the least resources and were constrained by their position in the caste hierarchy, much like the Dalits of modern India. Such distinctions had begun permeating into other communities too. In Muslim communities menials like the Haylock Horan, scavengers, were housed outside the boundaries of the village, similarly the Malazadas, literally, sons of boatmen, in Bihar were comparable to slaves. There was a direct correlation between caste, poverty and social status at the lower strata of society. Such correlations were not so marked at intermediate levels. In a manual from 17th century Mare War, Rajputs are mentioned as peasants, sharing the same space with Jats, who were accorded a lower status in the caste hierarchy. The Gauravas, who cultivated land around Vrindavan, Uttar Pradesh, sought Rajput status in the 17th century. Castes such as the Ahirs, Gujars, and Malas rose in the hierarchy because of the profitability of cattle rearing and horticulture. In the eastern regions, Intermediate pastoral and fishing castes like the Sajops and Kaivartas acquired the status of peasants. 2.2 Panchayats and Headmen The village Panchayat was an assembly of elders, usually important people of the village with hereditary rights over their property. In mixed caste villages, the Panchayat was usually a heterogeneous body. An oligarchy, the Panchayat represented various castes and communities in the village though the village menial come agricultural worker was unlikely to be represented there. The decisions made by these panchayats were binding on the members. The panchayat was headed by a headman known as Mukadam or Mandal. Some sources suggest that the headman was chosen through the consensus of the village elders, and that this choice had to be ratified by the Zami Ndar. Headmen held office as long as they enjoyed the confidence of the village elders, failing which they could be dismissed by them. The chief function of the headman was to supervise the preparation of village accounts, assisted by the accountant or patuary of the panchayat. The panchayat derived its funds from contributions made by individuals to a common financial pool. These funds were used for defraying the costs of entertaining revenue officials who visited the village from time to time. Expenses for community welfare activities such as tiding over natural calamities, like floods, were also met from these funds. Often these funds were also deployed in construction of a bund or digging a canal which peasants usually could not afford to do on their own. One important function of the panchayat was to ensure that caste boundaries among the various communities inhabiting the village were upheld. In eastern India all marriages were held in the presence of the mandal. In other words one of the duties of the village headman was to oversee the conduct of the members of the village community chiefly to prevent any offence against their caste. Panchayats also had the authority to levy fines and inflict more serious forms of punishment like expulsion from the community. The latter was a drastic step and was in most cases meted out for a limited period. It meant that a person forced to leave the village became an outcast and lost his right to practice his profession. Such a measure was intended as a deterrent to violation of caste norms. In addition to the village panchayat each caste or jatai in the village had its own jatai panchayat. These panchayats wielded considerable power in rural society. In Rajasthan Jatai panchayats arbitrated civil disputes between members of different castes. They mediated in contested claims on land, decided whether marriages were performed according to the norms laid down by a particular caste group, determined who had ritual precedence in village functions, and so on. In most cases, except in matters of criminal justice, the state respected the decisions of Jatai Panchayats. Archival records from Western India notably Rajasthan and Maharashtra contain petitions presented to the Panchayat complaining about extortionate taxation or the demand for unpaid labor, bigar, imposed by the superior castes or officials of the state. These petitions were usually made by villagers, from the lowest rungs of rural society. Often petitions were made collectively as well by a caste group or a community protesting against what they considered were morally illegitimate demands on the part of elite groups. 
These included excessive tax demands which, especially in times of drought or other disasters, endangered the peasants' subsistence. In the eyes of the petitioners the right to the basic minimum for survival was sanctioned by custom. They regarded the village panchayat as the court of appeal that would ensure that the state carried out its moral obligations and guaranteed justice. The decision of the panchayat in conflicts between lower caste peasants and state officials or the local Zami NDAR could vary from case to case. In cases of excessive revenue demands, the panchayat often suggested compromise. In cases where reconciliation failed, peasants took recourse to more drastic forms of resistance, such as deserting the village. The relatively easy availability of uncultivated land and the competition over labor resources made this an effective weapon in the hands of cultivators. 2.3 Village Artisans Another interesting aspect of the village was the elaborate relationship of exchange between different producers. Marathi documents and village surveys made in the early years of British rule have revealed the existence of substantial numbers of artisans, sometimes as high as 25 per center of the total households Indiana the villages. At times, however, the distinction between artisans and peasants in village society was a fluid one, as many groups performed the tasks of both. Cultivators and their families would also participate in craft production such as dyeing, textile printing, baking and firing of pottery, making and repairing agricultural implements. Phases in the agricultural calendar when there was a relative lull in activity, as between sowing and weeding or between weeding and harvesting, were a time when cultivators could engage in artisanal production. Village artisans potters, blacksmiths, carpenters, barbers, even goldsmiths provided specialized services in return for which they were compensated by villagers by a variety of means. The most common way of doing so was by giving them a share of the harvest, or an allotment of land, perhaps cultivable wastes, which was likely to be decided by the panchayat. In Maharashtra such lands became the artisans miris or wat in their hereditary holding. Another variant of this was a system where artisans and individual peasant households entered into a mutually negotiated system of remuneration, most of the time goods for services. For example, 18th century records tell us of zamindars in Bengal who remunerated blacksmiths, carpenters, even goldsmiths for their work by paying them a small daily allowance and diet money. This later came to be described as the Jajmani system, though the term was not in vogue in the 16th and 17th centuries. Such evidence is interesting because it indicates the intricate ways in which exchange networks operated at the micro level of the village. Cash remuneration was not entirely unknown either. 2.4 A Little Republic How does one understand the significance of the village community? Some British officials in the 19th century saw the village as a little republic made up of fraternal partners sharing resources and labor in a collective. However, this was not a sign of rural egalitarianism. There was individual ownership of assets and deep inequities based on caste and gender distinctions. A group of powerful individuals decided the affairs of the village, exploited the weaker sections and had the authority to dispense justice. More importantly, a cash nexus had already developed through trade between villages and towns. In the Mughal heartland too, revenue was assessed and collected in cash. Artisans producing for the export market, for example, weavers, received their advances or wages in cash as did producers of commercial products like cotton, silk, or indigo. 3. Women in Agrarian Society As you may have observed in many different societies, the production process often involves men and women performing certain specified roles. In the contexts that we are exploring, women and men had to work shoulder to shoulder in the fields. Men tilled and plowed, while women sowed, weeded, threshed, and winnowed the harvest. With the growth of nucleated villages and expansion in individuated peasant farming, which characterized medieval Indian agriculture, the basis of production was the labor and resources of the entire household. Naturally, a gendered segregation between the home, for women, and the world, for men, was not possible in this context. Nonetheless biases related to women's biological functions did continue. Menstruating women, for instance, were not allowed to touch the plough or the potter's wheel in western India, 
or enter the groves where beetle leaves, pawn, were grown in Bengal. Artisanal tasks such as spinning yarn, sifting and kneading clay for pottery, and embroidery were among the many aspects of production dependent on female labor. The more commercialized the product, the greater the demand on women's labor to produce it. In fact, peasant and artisan women worked not only in the fields, but even went to the houses of their employers or to the markets if necessary. Women were considered an important resource in agrarian society also because they were child bearers in a society dependent on labor. At the same time, high mortality rates among women owing to malnutrition, frequent pregnancies, death during childbirth often meant a shortage of wives. This led to the emergence of social customs in peasant and artisan communities that were distinct from those prevalent among elite groups. Marriages in many rural communities required the payment of bride price rather than dowry to the bride's family. Remarriage was considered legitimate both among divorced and widowed women. The importance attached to women as a reproductive force also meant that the fear of losing control over them was great. According to established social norms, the household was headed by a male. Thus women were kept under strict control by the male members of the family and the community. They could inflict draconian punishments if they suspected infidelity on the part of women. Documents from Western India Rajasthan, Gujarat and Maharashtra record petitions sent by women to the village Panchayat, seeking redress and justice. Wives protested against the infidelity of their husbands or the neglect of the wife and children by the male head of the household, the Grihasthi. While male infidelity was not always punished, the state and superior caste groups did intervene when it came to ensuring that the family was adequately provided for. In most cases when women petitioned to the panchayat, their names were excluded from the record, the petitioner was referred to as the mother, sister or wife of the male head of the household. Amongst the landed gentry, women had the right to inherit property. Instances from the Punjab show that women, including widows, actively participated in the rural land market as sellers of property inherited by them. Hindu and Muslim women inherited zamindaris which they were free to sell or mortgage. Women zamindars were known in 18th century Bengal. In fact, one of the biggest and most famous of the 18th century zamindaris, that of Rajshahi, had a woman at the helm. 4. Forests and Tribes 4.1 Beyond Settled Villages there was more to rural India than sedentary agriculture. Apart from the intensively cultivated provinces in northern and northwestern India, huge swathes of forests dense forest, jungle, or scrubland, carbandai, existed all over eastern India, central India, northern India, including the Terai on the Indo-Nepal border, Yaharkand, and in peninsular India down the western Ghats and the Deccan Plateau. Though it is nearly impossible to set an all-India average of the forest cover for this period, informed conjectures based on contemporary sources suggest an average of 40 per center. Forest dwellers were termed Jangli in contemporary texts. Being Jangli, however, did not mean an absence of civilization, as popular usage of the term today seems to connote. Rather, the term described those whose livelihood came from the gathering of forest produce hunting and shifting agriculture. These activities were largely season-specific. Among the pills, for example, spring was reserved for collecting forest produce, summer for fishing, the monsoon months for cultivation, and autumn and winter for hunting. Such a sequence presumed and perpetuated mobility, which was a distinctive feature of tribes inhabiting these forests. For the state, the forest was a subversive place a place of refuge, Mawas, for troublemakers. Once again, we turn to Babur who says that jungles provided a good defense behind which the people of the Pargana become stubbornly rebellious and pay no taxes. 4.2 Inroads into forests. External forces entered the forest in different ways. For instance, the state required elephants for the army. So the Peshkash levied from forest people often included a supply of elephants. In the Mughal political ideology, the hunt symbolized the overwhelming concern of the state to ensure justice to all its subjects, rich and poor. Regular hunting expeditions, so court historians tell us, 
enabled the emperor to travel across the extensive territories of his empire and personally attend to the grievances of its inhabitants. The hunt was a subject frequently painted by court artists. The painter resorted to the device of inserting a small scene somewhere in the picture that functioned as a symbol of a harmonious reign. The spread of commercial agriculture was an important external factor that impinged on the lives of those who lived in the forests. Forest products like honey, beeswax, and gum lac were in great demand. Some, such as gum lac, became major items of overseas export from India in the 17th century. Elephants were also captured and sold. Trade involved an exchange of commodities through barter as well. Some tribes, like the Luhanese and the Punjab, were engaged in overland trade between India and Afghanistan, and in the town country trade in the Punjab itself. Social factors too wrought changes in the lives of forest dwellers. Like the big men of the village community, tribes also had their chieftains. Many tribal chiefs had become zamindars, some even became kings. For this they required to build up an army. They recruited people from their lineage groups or demanded that their fraternity provide military service. Tribes in the Sindh region had armies comprising 6,000 cavalry and 7,000 infantry. In Assam, the Ahum kings had their paiks, people who were obliged to render military service in exchange for land. The capture of wild elephants was declared a royal monopoly by the Ahum kings. Though the transition from a tribal to a monarchical system had started much earlier, the process seems to have become fully developed only by the 16th century. This can be seen from the Anne's observations on the existence of tribal kingdoms in the northeast. War was a common occurrence. For instance, the Cook kings fought and subjugated a number of neighboring tribes in a long sequence of wars through the 16th and 17th centuries. New cultural influences also began to penetrate into forested zones. Some historians have indeed suggested that Sufi saints, peers, played a major role in the slow acceptance of Islam among agricultural communities emerging in newly colonized places. 5. The Zamindars Our story of agrarian relations in Mughal India will not be complete without referring to a class of people in the countryside that lived off agriculture but did not participate directly in the processes of agricultural production. These were the Zamindars who were landed proprietors who also enjoyed certain social and economic privileges by virtue of their superior status in rural society. Caste was one factor that accounted for the elevated status of Zamindars, another factor was that they performed certain services, kidmat, for the state. The Zamindars held extensive personal lands termed milkyat, meaning property. Milkyat lands were cultivated for the private use of Zamindars, often with the help of hired or servile labor. The Zamindars could sell, bequeath, or mortgage these lands at will. Zamindars also derived their power from the fact that they could often collect revenue on behalf of the state, a service for which they were compensated financially. Control over military resources was another source of power. Most Zamindars had fortresses, kilachas, as well as an armed contingent comprising units of cavalry, artillery, and infantry. Thus if we visualize social relations in the Mughal countryside as a pyramid, Zamindars clearly constituted its very narrow apex. Abu al-Fajl's account indicates that an upper caste, Brahmana Rajput combine had already established firm control over rural society. It also reflects a fairly large representation from the so-called intermediate castes, as we saw earlier, as well as a liberal sprinkling of Muslim Zamindaris. Contemporary documents give an impression that conquest may have been the source of the origin of some Zamindaris. The dispossession of weaker people by a powerful military chieftain was quite often a way of expanding a Zamindari. It is, however, unlikely that the state would have allowed such a show of aggression by a Zami Ndar unless he had been confirmed by an imperial order, Sanad. More important were the slow processes of Zamindari consolidation which are also documented in sources. These involved colonization of new lands, by transfer of rights, by order of the state and by purchase. These were the processes which perhaps permitted people belonging to the relatively lower castes to enter the rank of Zamindars as Zamindaris were bought and sold quite briskly in this period.
A combination of factors also allowed the consolidation of clan or lineagabist zamindaris. For example, the Rajputs and Jats adopted these strategies to consolidate their control over vast swathes of territory in northern India. Likewise, peasant pastoralists, like the Sajops, carved out powerful zamindaris in areas of central and southwestern Bengal. Zamindars spearheaded the colonization of agricultural land, and helped in settling cultivators by providing them with the means of cultivation, including cash loans. The buying and selling of zamindaris accelerated the process of monetization in the countryside. In addition, zamindars sold the produce from their milk yacht lands. There is evidence to show that zamindars often established markets, yachts, to which peasants also came to sell their produce. Although there can be little doubt that zamindars were an exploitative class, their relationship with the peasantry had an element of reciprocity, paternalism, and patronage. Two aspects reinforce this view. First, the Bhakta saints, who eloquently condemned caste-based and other forms of oppression, did not portray the zamindars, or, interestingly, the moneylender, as exploiters or oppressors of the peasantry. Usually it was the revenue official of the state who was the object of their ire. Second, in a large number of agrarian uprisings which erupted in North India in the 17th century, Zamindars often received the support of the peasantry in their struggle against the state. 6. Land Revenue System Revenue from the land was the economic mainstay of the Mughal Empire. It was therefore vital for the state to create an administrative apparatus to ensure control over agricultural production, and to fix and collect revenue from across the length and breadth of the rapidly expanding empire. This apparatus included the office, dafter, of the Diwan who was responsible for supervising the fiscal system of the empire. Thus revenue officials and record keepers penetrated the agricultural domain and became a decisive agent in shaping agrarian relations. The Mughal state tried to first acquire specific information about the extent of the agricultural lands in the empire and what these lands produced before fixing the burden of taxes on people. The land revenue arrangements consisted of two stages first, assessment, and then actual collection. The jama was the amount assessed, as opposed to hassle, the amount collected. In his list of duties of the amilguzar or revenue collector, Akbar decreed that while he should strive to make cultivators pay in cash, the option of payment in kind was also to be kept open. While fixing revenue, the attempt of the state was to maximize its claims. The scope of actually realizing these claims was, however, sometimes thwarted by local conditions. Both cultivated and cultivable lands were measured in each province. The AN compiled the aggregates of such lands during Akbar's rule. Efforts to measure lands continued under subsequent emperors. For instance, in 1665, Aurangzeb expressly instructed his revenue officials to prepare annual records of the number of cultivators in each village, source 7. Yet not all areas were measured successfully. As we have seen, forests covered huge areas of the subcontinent and thus remained unmeasured. 7. The Flow of Silver the Mughal Empire was among the large territorial empires in Asia that had managed to consolidate power and resources during the 16th and 17th centuries. These empires were the Ming, China, Seyfavid, Iran, and Ottoman, Turkey. The political stability achieved by all these empires helped create vibrant networks of overland trade from China to the Mediterranean Sea. Voyages of discovery and the opening up of the New World resulted in a massive expansion of Asia's, particularly India's, trade with Europe. This resulted in a greater geographical diversity of India's overseas trade as well as an expansion in the commodity composition of this trade. An expanding trade brought in huge amounts of silver bullion into Asia to pay for goods procured from India, and a large part of that bullion gravitated towards India. This was good for India as it did not have natural resources of silver. As a result, the period between the 16th and 18th centuries was also marked by a remarkable stability in the availability of metal currency, particularly the silver rupiah in India. This facilitated an unprecedented expansion of minting of coins and the circulation of money in the economy as well as the ability of the Mughal state to extract taxes and revenue in cash. 
The testimony of an Italian traveler, Giovanni Carri, who passed through India c. 1690, provides a graphic account about the way silver traveled across the globe to reach India. It also gives us an idea of the phenomenal amounts of cash and commodity transactions in 17th century India. 8. The Aini Akbari of Abu al Fazl Alami. The Aini Akbari was the culmination of a large historical, administrative project of classification undertaken by Abu al Fazl at the order of Emperor Akbar. It was completed in 1598, the 42nd regnal year of the emperor, after having gone through five revisions. The An was part of a larger project of history writing commissioned by Akbar. This history, known as the Akbar 5 AMA, comprised three books. The first two provided a historical narrative. We will look at these parts more closely in Chapter 9. The Aini Akbari, the third book, was organized as a compendium of imperial regulations and a gazetteer of the empire. The An gives detailed accounts of the organization of the court, administration, and army, the sources of revenue and the physical layout of the provinces of Akbar's empire and the literary, cultural, and religious traditions of the people. Along with a description of the various departments of Akbar's government and elaborate descriptions of the various provinces, subas, of the empire, the An gives us intricate quantitative information of those provinces. Collecting and compiling this information systematically was an important imperial exercise. It informed the emperor about the varied and diverse customs and practices prevailing across his extensive territories. The An is therefore a mine of information for us about the Mughal Empire during Akbar's reign. It is important, however, to keep in mind that this is a view of the regions from the center, a view of society from its apex. The An is made up of five books, dafters, of which the first three books describe the administration. The first book, called Manzale Beidi, concerns the imperial household and its maintenance. The second book, Sipa Beidi, covers the military and civil administration and the establishment of servants. This book includes notices and short biographical sketches of imperial officials, mansabdars, learned men, poets, and artists. The third book, Mulkabadi, is the one which deals with the fiscal side of the empire and provides rich quantitative information on revenue rates, followed by the account of the twelve provinces. This section has detailed statistical information, which includes the geographic, topographic and economic profile of all subas and their administrative and fiscal divisions, sarkars, parganas, and mahals total measured area, and assessed revenue, JAMA. After setting out details at the Suba level, the AN goes on to give a detailed picture of the Sarkars. Below the Suba. This it does in the form of tables, which have eight columns giving the following. Information. 1. Parganat slash Mahal, 2. Kila, Forts, 3. Arezi and Zamanai Paymuda, Measured Area, 4. Nakdi. Revenue assessed in cash, 5, Sayurgal, grants of revenue in charity, 6, Zamindars, columns 7 and 8 contain details of the castes of these Zamindars, and their troops including their horsemen, Sawar, foot soldiers, Piata, and elephants, Phil. The Mulkabadi gives a fascinating, detailed, and highly complex view of agrarian society in northern India. The fourth and fifth books, Dafters, deal with the religious, literary, and cultural traditions of the people of India and also contain a collection of Akbar's auspicious sayings. Although the An was officially sponsored to record detailed information to facilitate Emperor Akbar govern his empire, it was much more than a reproduction of official papers. That the manuscript was revised five times by the author would suggest a high degree of caution on the part of Abu al-Fazl and a search for authenticity. For instance, Oral testimonies were cross-checked and verified before being incorporated as facts in the chronicle. In the quantitative sections, all numeric data were reproduced in words so as to minimize the chances of subsequent transcriptional errors. Historians who have carefully studied the AN point out that it is not without its problems. Numerous errors in totaling have been detected. These are ascribed to simple slips of arithmetic or of transcription by Abu al-Fajl's assistants. 
These are generally minor and do not detract from the overall quantitative veracity of the manuals. Another limitation of the AN is the somewhat skewed nature of the quantitative data. Data were not collected uniformly from all provinces. For instance, while for many subas detailed information was compiled about the caste composition of the Zamindars, such information is not available for Bengal and Orissa. Further, while the fiscal data from the subas is remarkable for its richness, some equally vital parameters such as prices and wages from these same areas are not as well documented. The detailed list of prices and wages that the AN does provide is mainly derived from data pertaining to areas in or around the imperial capital of Agra, and is therefore of limited relevance for the rest of the country. These limitations notwithstanding, the AN remains an extraordinary document of its times. By providing fascinating glimpses into the structure and organization of the Mughal Empire and by giving us quantitative information about its products and people, Abu al Fazl achieved a major breakthrough in the tradition of medieval chroniclers who wrote mostly about remarkable political events wars, conquests, political machinations, and dynastic turmoil. Information about the country, its people, and its products was mentioned only incidentally and as embellishments to the essentially political thrust of the narrative. The AN completely departed from this tradition as it recorded information about the empire and the people of India, and thus constitutes a benchmark for studying India at the turn of the 17th century. The value of the AN's quantitative evidence is uncontested where the study of agrarian relations is concerned. But it is the information it contains on people, their professions, and trades and on the imperial establishment and the grandees of the empire which enables historians to reconstruct the social fabric of India at that time. Timeline Landmarks in the History of the Mughal Empire 1526 Babur defeats Ibrahim Lodi, the Delhi Sultan, at Panipat, becomes the first Mughal Emperor. 1530 to 1540 First phase of Humayun's reign. 1540 to 1555 Humayun defeated by Sher Shah, in exile at the Saifavid court. 1555 to 1556 Humayun regains lost territories. 1556 to 1605 Reign of Akbar. 1605 to 1627 Reign of Jahangir 1628 TP 1658 Reign of Shah Jahan 1658 to 1707 Reign of Aurangzeb 1739 Nader Shah invades India and sacks Delhi 1761 Ahmad Shah Abdelai defeats the Marathas in the Third Battle of Panipat. 1765 The Diwani of Bengal transferred to the East India Company. 1857 Last Mughal ruler, Bahadur Shah II. Deposed by the British and exiled to Rangoon. Present day Yangon, Myanmar. Source 1. Peasants on the Move. This was a feature of agrarian society which struck a keen observer like Babur, the first Mughal emperor, forcefully enough for him to write about it in the Babur 5 AMA, his memoirs. In Hindustan hamlets and villages, towns indeed, are depopulated and set up in a moment. If the people of a large town, one inhabited for years even, flee from it, they do it in such a way that not a sign or trace of them remains in a day and a half. On the other hand, if they fix their eyes on a place to settle, they need not dig water courses because their crops are all rain grown, and as the population of Hindustan is unlimited it swarms in. They make a tank or a well, they need not build houses or set up walls, cause grass abounds, wood is unlimited, huts are made, and straight away there is a village or a town. Source 2. Irrigating Trees and Fields. This is an excerpt from the Babur 5 AMA that describes the irrigation devices the emperor observed in northern India. The greater part of Hindustan country is situated on level land. Many though its towns and cultivated lands are, it nowhere has running waters. 4. Water is not at all a necessity in cultivating crops and orchards. Autumn crops grow by the downpour of the rains themselves, and strange it is that spring crops grow even when no rains fall. However, 
to young trees water is made to flow by means of buckets or wheels. In Lahore, Dipalpur, both in present-day Pakistan, and those other parts, people water by means of a wheel. They make two circles of rope long enough to suit the depths of the well, fix strips of wood between them, and on these fasten pitchers. The ropes with the wood and attached pitchers are put over the wheel well. At one end of the wheel axle a second wheel is fixed, and close to it another on an upright axle. The last wheel the bullock turns, its teeth catch in the teeth of the second, wheel, and thus the wheel with the pitchers is turned. A trough is set where the water empties from the pitchers and from this the water is conveyed everywhere. In Agra, Shandwar, Bayana, all in present day Uttar Pradesh, and those parts again, people water with a bucket. At the well edge they set up a fork of wood, having a roller adjusted between the forks, tie a rope to a large bucket, put the rope over a roller, and tie its other end to the bullock. One person must drive the bullock, another empty the bucket. The spread of tobacco. This plant, which arrived first in the Deccan, spread to northern India in the early years of the 17th century. The An does not mention tobacco in the lists of crops in northern India. Akbar and his nobles came across tobacco for the first time in 1604. At this time smoking tobacco, in hookahs or chillums, seems to have caught on in a big way. Jahangir was so concerned about its addiction that he banned it. This was totally ineffective because by the end of the 17th century, tobacco had become a major article of consumption, cultivation, and trade all over India. Agricultural Prosperity and Population Growth One important outcome of such varied and flexible forms of agricultural production was a slow demographic growth. Despite periodic disruptions caused by famines and epidemics, India's population increased, according to calculations by economic historians, by about 50 million people between 1,600 and 1,800, which is an increase of about 33 per center over 200 years. Corrupt Mandals The Mandals often misused their positions. They were principally accused of defrauding village accounts in connivance with the Patwari and for under-assessing the revenue they owed from their own lands in order to pass the additional burden on to the smaller cultivator. Money in the village The 17th century French traveller Jean-Baptiste Tavernier found it remarkable that in India a village must be very small indeed if it has not a money changer called a shroff. They, act as bankers to make remittances of money, and who, enhance the rupee as they please for paisa and the paisa for these, kari, shells. Pargana was an administrative subdivision of a Mughal province. Peshkash was a form of tribute collected by the Mughal state. Source 3. Clearance of Forests for Agricultural Settlements. This is an excerpt from a 16th century Bengali poem, Chandi Mangala, composed by Mukund Aram. Chakrabarti. The hero of the poem, Kalakatu, set up a kingdom by clearing forests. Hearing the news, Outsiders came from various lands. Kalakatu then bought and distributed among them heavy knives, axes, battle axes, and pikes. From the north came the Das, people, 100 of them advanced. They were struck with wonder on seeing Kalakatu who distributed betel nut to each of them. From the south came the harvesters, 500 of them under one organizer. From the west came Zafar Mian together with 22,000 men. Sula Imani beads in their hands they chanted the names of their Pur and Paksambar, Prophet. Having cleared the forest they established markets. Hundreds and hundreds of foreigners ate and entered the forest. Hearing the sound of the axe, tigers became apprehensive and ran away, roaring. Source 4. Trade between the hill tribes and the plains, c. 1595. This is how Abu al Fazl describes the transactions between the hill tribes and the plains in the Suba of Awad, part of present day Uttar Pradesh. From the northern mountains, quantities of goods are carried on the backs of men, of stout ponies, and of goats, such as gold, copper, lead, musk, tails of the cutest cow, the yak, honey, chuk an acid composed of orange juice and lemon boiled together, pomegranate seed, 
ginger, long pepper, magath, a plant producing a red dye, root, borax, zedoary, a root resembling turmeric, wax, woolen stuffs, wooden wear, hawks, falcons, black falcons, merlins, a kind of bird, and other articles. In exchange they carry back white and colored cloths, amber, salt, asafetida, ornaments, glass, and earthenware. A Parallel Army According to the An, the combined military strength of the Zamindars in Mughal India was 384,558. Cavalry, 4,277,057 infantry, 1,863 elephants, 4,260 cannons, and 4,500 boats. Amun was an official responsible for ensuring that imperial regulations were carried out in the provinces. Source 5. Classification of lands under Akbar. The following is a listing of criteria of classification excerpted from the An. The Emperor Akbar in his profound sagacity classified the lands and fixed a different revenue to be paid by each. Pala is land which is annually cultivated for each crop in succession and is never allowed to lie fallow. Parayudi is land left out of cultivation for a time that it may recover its strength. Chachar is land that has lain fallow for three or four years. Banjar is land uncultivated for five years and more. Of the first two kinds of land, there are three classes, good, middling, and bad. They add together the produce of each sort, and the third of this represents the medium produce, onet herd part of which is exacted as the royal dues. The Mansab Dairy System The Mughal administrative system had at its apex a military cum bureaucratic apparatus, Mansab Dairy, which was responsible for looking after the civil and military affairs of the state. Some Mansabdars were paid in cash, Nakdi, while the majority of them were paid through assignments of revenue, Jajirs, in different regions of the empire. They were transferred periodically. See also Chapter 9. Source 7. The Jama. This is an excerpt from Aurangzeb's order to his revenue official, 1665. He should direct the Amans of the Parganas that they should discover the actual conditions of cultivation, Maujodat village by village, peasant-wise, Asimawar, and after minute scrutiny, assess the Jama, keeping in view the financial interests, Kifaya, of the government, and the welfare of the peasantry. Why do you think the emperor insisted on a detailed survey? Source 6. Cash or Kind. The An on Land Revenue Collection. Let him, the Amilguzer, not make it a practice of taking only in cash but also in kind. The latter is effected in several ways. First, can cut, in the Hindi language gone signifies grain, and cut, estimates. If any doubts arise, the crops should be cut and estimated in three lots, the good, the middling, and the inferior, and the hesitation removed. Often, too, the land taken by appraisement, gives a sufficiently accurate return. Secondly, batai, also called bailai. The crops are reaped and stacked and divided by agreement in the presence of the parties. But in this case several intelligent inspectors are required, otherwise, the evil-minded and false are given to deception. Thirdly, ket batai, when they divide the fields after they are sown. Fourthly, lang batai, after cutting the grain, they form it in heaps and divide it among themselves, and each takes his share home and turns it to profit. What difference would each of the systems of assessment and collection of revenue have made to the cultivator? Source 8. How Silver Came to India. This excerpt from Giovanni Carey's account, based on Bernese account, gives an idea of the enormous amount of wealth that found its way into the Mughal Empire. That the reader may form some idea of the wealth of this Mughal Empire, he is to observe that all the gold and silver, which circulates throughout the world at last centers here. It is well known that as much of it comes out of America, after running through several kingdoms of Europe, goes partly into Turkey, Turkey, for several sorts of commodities, and part into Persia, by the way of Smyrna for silk. Now the Turks not being able to abstain from coffee, which comes from Hyman, Oman, and Arabia, nor Persia, 
Arabia, and the Turks themselves to go without the commodities of India, send vast quantities of money, money, to Mocha, Mocha, on the Red Sea, near Babel Mondel, to Basra, Basra, at the bottom of the Persian Gulf, Gulf, which is afterwards sent over in ships to Indostan, Hindustan. Besides the Indian, Dutch, English, and Portuguese ships, that every year carry the commodities of Indostan, to Pegu, Tanaseri, parts of Myanmar, Siam, Thailand, Ceylon, Sri Lanka, the Maldive Islands, Mozambique, and other places, must of necessity convey much gold and silver thither, from those countries. All that the Dutch fetch from the mines in Japan, sooner or later, goes to Indostan, and the goods carry de hence into Europe, whether to France, England, or Portugal, are all purchased d for ready money, which remains there. Source 9. Moistening the Rose Garden of Fortune. In this extract Abu El Fazl gives a vivid account of how and from whom he collected his information. To Abu El Fazl, son of Mubarak, this sublime mandate was given. Write with the pen of sincerity the account of the glorious events and of our dominion conquering victories. Assuredly, I spent much labor and research in collecting the records and narratives of His Majesty's actions and I was a long time interrogating the servants of the state and the old members of the illustrious family. I examined both prudent, truth-speaking old men and active-minded, right-actioned young ones and reduced their statements to writing. The royal commands were issued to the provinces, that those who from old service remembered, with certainty or with adminical of doubt, the events of the past, should copy out the notes and memoranda and transit them to the court. Then, a second command shone forth from the Holy Presence Chamber, to wit that the materials which had been collected should be recited in the royal hearing, and whatever might have to be written down afterwards, should be introduced into the noble volume as a supplement, and that such details as on account of the minuteness of the inquiries and the minuti of affairs, which, could not then be brought to an end, should be inserted afterwards at my leisure. Being relieved by this royal order the interpreter of the divine ordinance from the secret anxiety of my heart, I proceeded to reduce into writing the rough drafts, drafts, which were void of the grace of arrangement and style. I obtained the chronicle of events beginning at the nineteenth year of the divine era, when the record office was established by the enlightened intellect of His Majesty, and from its rich pages, I gathered the accounts of many events. Great pains too were taken to procure the originals or copies of most of the orders which had been issued to the provinces from the accession up to the present day. I also took much trouble to incorporate many of the reports which ministers and high officials had submitted, about the affairs of the empire and the events of foreign countries. And my labor-loving soul was satiated by the apparatus of inquiry and research. I also exerted myself energetically to collect the rough notes and memoranda of sagacious and well-informed men. By these means, I constructed a reservoir for irrigating and moistening the Rose Garden of Fortune, the Akbar. 5 AMA Translating the An Given the importance of the An, it has been translated for use by a number of scholars. Henry Blockman edited it and the Asiatic Society of Bengal, Calcutta, present-day Kolkata, published it in its Bibliotheca Indica series. The book has also been translated into English in three volumes. The standard translation of Volume 1 is that of Henry Blockman, Calcutta 1873. The other two volumes were translated by H.S. Jarrett, Calcutta 1891 and 1894. Theme 9. Kings and Chronicles. The Mughal Courts. C. 16th to 17th centuries. The rulers of the Mughal Empire saw themselves as appointed by divine will to rule over a large and heterogeneous populace. Although this grand vision was often circumscribed by actual political circumstances, it remained important. One way of transmitting this vision was through the writing of dynastic histories. The Mughal kings commissioned court historians to write accounts. These accounts recorded the events of the emperor's time. In addition, their writers collected vast amounts of information from the regions of the subcontinent to help the rulers govern their domain. Modern historians writing in English have termed this genre of texts chronicles, 
as they present a continuous chronological record of events. Chronicles are an indispensable source for any scholar wishing to write a history of the Mughals. At one level they were a repository of factual information about the institutions of the Mughal state, painstakingly collected and classified by individuals closely connected with the court. At the same time these texts were intended as conveyors of meanings that the Mughal rulers sought to impose on their domain. They therefore give us a glimpse into how imperial ideologies were created and disseminated. This chapter will look at the workings of this rich and fascinating dimension of the Mughal Empire. 1. The Mughals and their Empire The name Mughal derives from Mongol. Though today the term evokes the grandeur of an empire, it was not the name the rulers of the dynasty chose for themselves. They referred to themselves as Timurids, as descendants of the Turkish ruler Timur on the paternal side. Babur, the first Mughal ruler, was related to Genghis Khan from his mother's side. He spoke Turkish and referred derisively to the Mongols as barbaric hordes. During the 16th century, Europeans used the term Mughal to describe the Indian rulers of this branch of the family. Over the past centuries the word has been frequently used even the name Mowgli, the young hero of Rudyard Kipling's Jungle Book, is derived from it. The empire was carved out of a number of regional states of India through conquests and political alliances between the Mughals and local chieftains. The founder of the empire, Zahiruddin Babur, was driven from his Central Asian homeland, Fargana, by the warring Uzbeks. He first established himself at Kabul and then in 1526 pushed further into the Indian subcontinent in search of territories and resources to satisfy the needs of the members of his clan. His successor, Nasiruddin Humayun, 1530-1540-1555-1556, expanded the frontiers of the empire, but lost it to the Afghan leader Sher Shah Sir, who drove him into exile. Humayun took refuge in the court of the Saifavid ruler of Iran. In 1555 Humayun defeated the Sirs, but died a year later. Many consider Jalaluddin Akbar, 1556-1605, the greatest of all the Mughal emperors, for he not only expanded but also consolidated his empire, making it the largest, strongest, and richest kingdom of his time. Akbar succeeded in extending the frontiers of the empire to the Hindu Kush mountains, and checked the expansionist designs of the Uzbeks of Turin, Central Asia, and the Safavids of Iran. Akbar had three fairly able successors in Jahangir, 1605-1627, Shah Jahan, 1628-1658, and Aurangzeb, 1658-1707, much as their characters varied. Under them the territorial expansion continued, though at a much reduced pace. The three rulers maintained and consolidated the various instruments of governance. During the 16th and 17th centuries the institutions of an imperial structure were created. These included effective methods of administration and taxation. The visible center of Mughal power was the court. Here political alliances and relationships were forged, status and hierarchies defined. The political system devised by the Mughals was based on a combination of military power and conscious policy to accommodate the different traditions they encountered in the subcontinent. After 1707, following the death of Aurangzeb, the power of the dynasty diminished. In place of the vast apparatus of empire controlled from Delhi, Agra, or Lahore the different capital cities regional powers acquired greater autonomy. Yet symbolically the prestige of the Mughal ruler did not lose its aura. In 1857 the last scion of this dynasty, Bahadur Shah Zafar II, was overthrown by the British. 2. The Production of Chronicles Chronicles commissioned by the Mughal emperors are an important source for studying the empire and its court. They were written in order to project a vision of an enlightened kingdom to all those who came under its umbrella. At the same time they were meant to convey to those who resisted the rule of the Mughals that all resistance was destined to fail. Also, the rulers wanted to ensure that there was an account of their rule for posterity. 
the authors of Mughal chronicles were invariably courtiers. The histories they wrote focused on events centered on the ruler, his family, the court, and nobles, wars and administrative arrangements. Their titles, such as the Akbar 5 AMA, Shah Jahan 5 AMA, Alamjur 5 AMA, that is, the story of Akbar, Shah Jahan, and Alamjur, a title of the Mughal ruler Aurangzeb, suggest that in the eyes of their authors the history of the empire and the court was synonymous with that of the emperor. 2.1 From Turkish to Persian Mughal court chronicles were written in Persian. Under the sultans of Delhi it flourished as a language of the court and of literary writings, alongside North Indian languages, especially Hindavi, and its regional variants. As the Mughals were Chaktai Turks by origin, Turkish was their mother tongue. Their first ruler Babur wrote poetry and his memoirs in this language. It was Akbar who consciously set out to make Persian the leading language of the Mughal court. Cultural and intellectual contacts with Iran, as well as a regular stream of Iranian and Central Asian migrants seeking positions at the Mughal court, might have motivated the emperor to adopt the language. Persian was elevated to a language of empire, conferring power and prestige on those who had a command of it. It was spoken by the king, the royal household and the elite at court. Further, it became the language of administration at all levels so that accountants, clerks and other functionaries also learned it. Even when Persian was not directly used, its vocabulary and idiom heavily influenced the language of official records in Rajasthani and Marathi and even Tamil. Since the people using Persian in the 16th and 17th centuries came from many different regions of the subcontinent and spoke other Indian languages, Persian too became Indianist by absorbing local idioms. A new language, Urdu, sprang from the interaction of Persian with Hindavi. Mughal chronicles such as the Akbar 5 AMA were written in Persian, others, like Babur's memoirs, were translated from the Turkish into the Persian Babur 5 AMA. Translations of Sanskrit texts such as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana into Persian were commissioned by the Mughal emperors. The Mahabharata was translated as the Rajmnama. Book of Wars 2.2 The Making of Manuscripts All books in Mughal India were manuscripts, that is, they were handwritten. The center of manuscript production was the imperial Kitab Khana. Although Kitab Khana can be translated as library, it was a scriptorium, that is, a place where the emperor's collection of manuscripts was kept and new manuscripts were produced. The creation of a manuscript involved a number of people performing a variety of tasks. Paper makers were needed to prepare the folios of the manuscript, scribes or calligraphers to copy the text, guilders to illuminate the pages, painters to illustrate scenes from the text, bookbinders to gather the individual folios and set them within ornamental covers. The finished manuscript was seen as a precious object, a work of intellectual wealth and beauty. It exemplified the power of its patron, the Mughal emperor, to bring such beauty into being. At the same time some of the people involved in the actual production of the manuscript also got recognition in the form of titles and awards. Of these, calligraphers and painters held a high social standing while others, such as paper makers or bookbinders, have remained anonymous artisans. Calligraphy, the art of handwriting, was considered a skill of great importance. It was practiced using different styles. Akbar's favorite was the nastalik a fluid style with long horizontal strokes. It is written using a piece of trimmed reed with a tip of 5 to 10 mm called callum, dipped in carbon ink, see ya he. The nib of the callum is usually split in the middle to facilitate the absorption of ink. 3. The Painted Image As we read in the previous section, painters too were involved in the production of Mughal manuscripts. Chronicles narrating the events of a Mughal emperor's reign contained alongside the written text, images that described an event in visual form. When scenes or themes in a book were to be given visual expression, the scribe left blank spaces on nearby pages, paintings, executed separately by artists, were inserted to accompany what was described in words. These paintings were miniatures, and could therefore be passed around for viewing and mounting on the pages of manuscripts. Paintings served not only to enhance the beauty of a book, 
but were believed to possess special powers of communicating ideas about the kingdom and the power of kings in ways that the written medium could not. The historian Abu al Fazl described painting as a magical art, in his view, it had the power to make inanimate objects look as if they possessed life. The production of paintings portraying the emperor, his court, and the people who were part of it, was a source of constant tension between rulers and representatives of the Muslim orthodoxy, the ulama. The latter did not fail to invoke the Islamic prohibition of the portrayal of human beings enshrined in the Quran as well as the Hadith, which described an incident from the life of the Prophet Muhammad. Here the Prophet is cited as having forbidden the depiction of living beings in a naturalistic manner as it would suggest that the artist was seeking to appropriate the power of creation. This was a function that was believed to belong exclusively to God. Yet interpretations of the Sharia changed with time. The body of Islamic tradition was interpreted in different ways by various social groups. Frequently each group put forward an understanding of tradition that would best suit their political needs. Muslim rulers in many Asian regions during centuries of empire building regularly commissioned artists to paint their portraits and scenes of life in their kingdoms. The Safavid kings of Iran, for example, patronized the finest artists, who were trained in workshops set up at court. The names of painters such as that of Bilzad contributed to spreading the cultural fame of the Safavid court far and wide. Artists from Iran also made their way to Mughal India. Some were brought to the Mughal court, as in the case of Mir Sayyid Ali and Abdus Samad, who were made to accompany Emperor Humayun to Delhi. Others migrated in search of opportunities to win patronage and prestige. A conflict between the emperor and the spokesman of orthodox Muslim opinion on the question of visual representations of living beings was a source of tension at the Mughal court. Akbar's court historian Abu al-Fazl cites the emperor as saying, There are many that hate painting, but such men I dislike. It appears to me that an artist has a unique way of recognizing God when he must come to feel that he cannot bestow life on his work. 4. The Akbar Nama and the Bad Shah Nama. Among the important illustrated Mughal chronicles the Akbar 5 AMA and Bad Shah 5 AMA, the Chronicle of a King, are the most well known. Each manuscript contained an average of 150 full or daublapage paintings of battles, sieges, hunts, building construction, court scenes, etc. The author of the Akbar 5 AMA, Abu al Fazl, grew up in the Mughal capital of Agra. He was widely read in Arabic, Persian, Greek philosophy, and Sufism. Moreover, he was a forceful debater and independent thinker who consistently opposed the views of the conservative ulama. These qualities impressed Akbar, who found Abu al Fazl ideally suited as an advisor and a spokesperson for his policies. One major objective of the emperor was to free the state from the control of religious orthodoxy. In his role as court historian, Abu al Fazl both shaped and articulated the ideas associated with the reign of Akbar. Beginning in 1589, Abu al Fazl worked on the Akbar 5 AMA for 13 years, repeatedly revising the draft. The chronicle is based on a range of sources, including actual records of events, wakay, official documents, and oral testimonies of knowledgeable persons. The Akbar 5 AMA is divided into three books of which the first two are chronicles. The third book is the Aini Akbari. The first volume contains the history of mankind from Adam to one celestial cycle of Akbar's life, 30 years. The second volume closes in the 46th regnal year, 1601, of Akbar. The very next year Abu al Fazl fell victim to a conspiracy hatched by Prince Salim, and was murdered by his accomplice, Bursing Bundala. The Akbar 5 AMA was written to provide a detailed description of Akbar's reign in the traditional diachronic sense of recording politically significant events across time, as well as in the more novel sense of giving a synchronic picture of all aspects of Akbar's empire geographic, social, administrative and cultural without reference to chronology. In the Aini Akbari the Mughal Empire is presented as having a diverse population consisting of Hindus, Jainas, Buddhists, and Muslims in a composite culture. Abu al Fazl wrote in a language that was ornate and which attached importance to diction and rhythm, as texts were often read aloud. This Indo-Persian style was patronized at court, 
and there were a large number of writers who wanted to write like Abu El Fazl. A pupil of Abu El Fazl, Abdul Hamid Lahori is known as the author of the Bad Shah 5 AMA. Emperor Shah Jahan, hearing of his talents, commissioned him to write a history of his reign modeled on the Akbar 5 AMA. The Bad Shah 5 AMA is this official history in three volumes, dafters, of ten lunar years each. Lahori wrote the first and second dafters comprising the first two decades of the emperor's rule, 1627 to 1647, these volumes were later revised by Sajila Khan, Shah Jahan's wazir. Infirmities of old age prevented Lahori from proceeding with the third decade which was then chronicled by the historian Waris. During the colonial period, British administrators began to study Indian history and to create an archive of knowledge about the subcontinent to help them better understand the people and the cultures of the empire they sought to rule. The Asiatic Society of Bengal, founded by Sir William Jones in 1784, undertook the editing, printing and translation of many Indian manuscripts. Edited versions of the Akbar 5 AMA and Bad Shah 5 AMA were first published by the Asiatic Society in the 19th century. In the early 20th century the Akbar 5 AMA was translated into English by Henry Beveridge after years of hard labor. Only excerpts of the Bad Shah 5 AMA have been translated into English to date, the text in its entirety still awaits translation. 5. The Ideal Kingdom 5.1 A Divine Light Court chroniclers drew upon many sources to show that the power of the Mughal kings came directly from God. One of the legends they narrated was that of the Mongol Queen Alanka, who was impregnated by a ray of sunshine while resting in her tent. The offspring she bore carried this divine light and passed it on from generation to generation. Abu El Fazl placed Mughal kingship as the highest station in the hierarchy of objects receiving light emanating from God, Farid Izadi. Here he was inspired by a famous Iranian Sufi, Shihabuddin Sarawardi, dead. 1191, who first developed this idea. According to this idea, there was a hierarchy in which the divine light was transmitted to the king who then became the source of spiritual guidance for his subjects. Paintings that accompanied the narrative of the chronicles transmitted these ideas in a way that left a lasting impression on the minds of viewers. Mughal artists, from the 17th century onwards, began to portray emperors wearing the halo which they saw on European paintings of Christ and the Virgin Mary to symbolize the light of God. 5.2 A Unifying Force Mughal chronicles present the empire as comprising many different ethnic and religious communities. Hindus, Jainas, Zoroastrians, and Muslims. As the source of all peace and stability the emperor stood above all religious and ethnic groups, mediated among them, and ensured that justice and peace prevailed. Abu El Fazl describes the ideal of Sulhai Kol, absolute peace, as the cornerstone of enlightened rule. In Sulhai Kol all religions and schools of thought had freedom of expression but on condition that they did not undermine the authority of the state or fight among themselves. The ideal of Sulhai Kol was implemented through state policies the nobility under the Mughals was a composite one comprising Iranis, Turanis, Afghans, Rajputs, Deccanis all of whom were given positions and awards purely on the basis of their service and loyalty to the king. Further, Akbar abolished the tax on pilgrimage in 1563 and Jitsya in 1564 as the two were based on religious discrimination. Instructions were sent to officers of the empire to follow the precept of Sulhai Kul in administration. All Mughal emperors gave grants to support the building and maintenance of places of worship. Even when temples were destroyed during war, grants were later issued for their repair as we know from the reigns of Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. However, during the reign of the latter, the jizya was reimposed on non-Muslim subjects. 5.3 Just Sovereignty as Social Contract Abu El Fazl defined sovereignty as a social contract, the emperor protects the four essences of his subjects, namely, life, jan, property, mal, honor, Namus, and faith, din, and in return demands obedience and a share of resources. Only just sovereigns were thought to be able to honor the contract with power and divine guidance. 
A number of symbols were created for visual representation of the idea of justice which came to stand for the highest virtue of Mughal monarchy. One of the favorite symbols used by artists was the motif of the lion and the lamb, or goat, peacefully nestling next to each other. This was meant to signify a realm where both the strong and the weak could exist in harmony. Court scenes from the illustrated Bad Shah 5 AMA place such motifs in a niche directly below the emperor's throne. 6. Capitals and Courts 6.1 Capital Cities The heart of the Mughal Empire was its capital city, where the court assembled. The capital cities of the Mughals frequently shifted during the 16th and 17th centuries. Babur took over the Lodi capital of Agra, though during the four years of his reign the court was frequently on the move. During the 1560s Akbar had the fort of Agra constructed with red sandstone quarried from the adjoining regions. In the 1570s he decided to build a new capital, Fatepur Sikri. One of the reasons prompting this may have been that Sikri was located on the direct road to Ajmer, where the Dargah of Sheikh Muanuddin Kishti had become an important pilgrimage center. The Mughal emperors entered into a close relationship with Sufis of the Kishti Silsila. Akbar commissioned the construction of a white marble tomb for Sheikh Salim Kishti next to the majestic Friday Mosque at Sikri. The enormous arched gateway, Buland Darwaza, was meant to remind visitors of the Mughal victory in Gujarat. In 1585 the capital was transferred to Lahore to bring the northwest under greater control and Akbar closely watched the frontier for 13 years. Shah Jahan pursued sound fiscal policies and accumulated enough money to indulge his passion for building. Building activity in monarchical cultures, as you have seen in the case of earlier rulers, was the most visible and tangible sign of dynastic power, wealth, and prestige. In the case of Muslim rulers it was also considered an act of piety. In 1648, the court army and household moved from Agra to the newly completed imperial capital, Shah Jahan Abad. It was a new addition to the old residential city of Delhi, with the Red Fort, the Jama Masjid, a trilined esplanade with bazaars, Chandni Chowk, and spacious homes for the nobility. Shah Jahan's new city was appropriate to a more formal vision of a grand monarchy. 6.2 The Mughal Court The physical arrangement of the court, focused on the sovereign, mirrored his status as the heart of society. Its centerpiece was therefore the throne, the tact, which gave physical form to the function of the sovereign as axis mundi. The canopy, a symbol of kingship in India for a millennium, was believed to separate the radiance of the sun from that of the sovereign. Chronicles lay down with great precision the rules defining status amongst the Mughal elites. In court, status was determined by spatial proximity to the king. The place accorded to a courtier by the ruler was a sign of his importance in the eyes of the emperor. Once the emperor sat on the throne, no one was permitted to move from his position or to leave without permission. Social control in court society was exercised through carefully defining in full detail the forms of address, courtesies, and speech which were acceptable in court. The slightest infringement of etiquette was noticed and punished on the spot. The forms of salutation to the ruler indicated the person's status in the hierarchy, deeper prostration represented higher status. The highest form of submission was sijda or complete prostration. Under Shah Jahan these rituals were replaced with Chahar Taslim and Zaminbos, kissing the ground. The protocols governing diplomatic envoys at the Mughal court were equally explicit. An ambassador presented to the Mughal emperor was expected to offer an acceptable form of greeting either by bowing deeply or kissing the ground, or else to follow the Persian custom of clasping one's hands in front of the chest. Thomas Rowe, the English envoy of James I simply bowed before Jahangir according to European custom, and further shocked the court by demanding a chair. The emperor began his day at sunrise with personal religious devotions or prayers, and then appeared on a small balcony, the Yaharika, facing the east. Below, a crowd of people, soldiers, merchants, craftspersons, peasants, women with sick children, waited for a view, darshan, of the emperor. Yaharika Darshan was introduced by Akbar with the objective of broadening the acceptance of the imperial authority as part of popular faith. After spending an hour at the Yaharika, 
the emperor walked to the public hall of audience, Diwani Am, to conduct the primary business of his government. State officials presented reports and made requests. Two hours later, the emperor was in the Diwani cause to hold private audiences and discuss confidential matters. High ministers of state placed their petitions before him and tax officials presented their accounts. Occasionally, the emperor viewed the works of highly reputed artists or building plans of architects, Mimar. On special occasions such as the anniversary of accession to the throne, i.d., Shabai Bharat and Holi, the court was full of life. Perfumed candles set in rich holders and palace walls festooned with colorful hangings made a tremendous impression on visitors. The Mughal kings celebrated three major festivals a year, the solar and lunar birthdays of the monarch and Nauruaz, the Iranian New Year on the vernal equinox. On his birthdays, the monarch was weighed against various commodities which were then distributed in charity. 6.3 Titles and Gifts Grand titles were adopted by the Mughal emperors at the time of coronation or after a victory over an enemy. High-sounding and rhythmic, they created an atmosphere of awe in the audience when announced by ushers, Nakib. Mughal coins carried the full title of the reigning emperor with regal protocol. The granting of titles to men of merit was an important aspect of Mughal polity. A man's ascent in the court hierarchy could be traced through the titles he held. The title Asaf Khan for one of the highest ministers originated with Asaf, the legendary minister of the prophet King Suleiman, Solomon. The title Mirza Raja was accorded by Aurangzeb to his two highest ranking nobles, Jay Singh and Jaswant Singh. Titles could be earned or paid for. Mir Khan offered Rs 1 lakh to Aurangzeb for the letter Aleph, that is A, to be added to his name to make it A Mir Khan. Other awards included the Robe of Honor, Kilat, a garment once worn by the emperor and imbued with his benediction. One gift, the Sarapa, head to foot, consisted of a tunic, a turban, and a sash, Patka. Jeweled ornaments were often given as gifts by the emperor. The lotus blossom set with jewels, Padma Murasa, was given only in exceptional circumstances. A courtier never approached the emperor empty-handed, he offered either a small sum of money, Nazr, or a large amount, Peshkash. In diplomatic relations, gifts were regarded as a sign of honor and respect. Ambassadors performed the important function of negotiating treaties and relationships between competing political powers. In such a context gifts had an important symbolic role. Thomas Rowe was disappointed when a ring he had presented to Asaf Khan was returned to him for the reason that it was worth merely 400 rupees. 7. The Imperial Household The term harem is frequently used to refer to the domestic world of the Mughals. It originates in the Persian word harem, meaning a sacred place. The Mughal household consisted of the emperor's wives and concubines his near and distant relatives, mother, step, and foster mothers, sisters, daughters, daughters-in-law, aunts, children, etc., and female servants and slaves. Polygamy was practiced widely in the Indian subcontinent, especially among the ruling groups. Both for the Rajput clans as well as the Mughals marriage was a way of cementing political relationships and forging alliances. The gift of territory was often accompanied by the gift of a daughter in marriage. This ensured a continuing hierarchical relationship between ruling groups. It was through the link of marriage and the relationships that developed as a result that the Mughals were able to form a vast kinship network that linked them to important groups and helped to hold a vast empire together. In the Mughal household a distinction was maintained between wives who came from royal families, Bagams, and other wives, Agas who were not of noble birth. The Bagams, married after receiving huge amounts of cash and valuables as dower, Mar, naturally received a higher status and greater attention from their husbands than did Agas. The concubines, Agacha or the lesser Aga, occupied the lowest position in the hierarchy of females intimately related to royalty. They all received monthly allowances in cash, supplemented with gifts according to their status. The Lineagabist family structure was not entirely static. The Aga and the Agacha could rise to the position of a Bagam depending on the husband's will, and provided that he did not already have four wives. 
Love and motherhood played important roles in elevating such women to the status of legally wedded wives. Apart from wives, numerous male and female slaves populated the Mughal household. The tasks they performed varied from the most mundane to those requiring skill, tact, and intelligence. Slave eunuchs, Quajisara, moved between the external and internal life of the household as guards, servants, and also as agents for women dabbling in commerce. After Nurjahan, Mughal queens and princesses began to control significant financial resources. Shah Jahan's daughters Hahanara and Roshanara enjoyed an annual income often equal to that of high imperial mansabdars. Hahanara, in addition, received revenues from the port city of Surat, which was a lucrative center of overseas trade. Control over resources enabled important women of the Mughal household to commission buildings and gardens. Hahanara participated in many architectural projects of Shah Jahan's new capital, Shah Jahanabad, Delhi. Among these was an imposing double-storied caravanserai with a courtyard and garden. The Bazaar of Chandni Chowk, the throbbing center of Shah Jahanabad, was designed by Hahanara. An interesting book giving us a glimpse into the domestic world of the Mughals is the Humayun. 5 AMA written by Gulbaddin Begum Gulbaddin was the daughter of Babur, Humayun's sister, and Akbar's aunt. Gulbaddin could write fluently in Turkish and Persian. When Akbar commissioned Abu el Fazl to write a history of his reign, he requested his aunt to record her memoirs of earlier times under Babur and Humayun, for Abu el Fazl to draw upon. What Gulbaddin wrote was no eulogy of the Mughal emperors. Rather she described in great detail the conflicts and tensions among the princes and kings and the important mediating role elderly women of the family played in resolving some of these conflicts. 8. The Imperial Officials 8.1 Recruitment and Rank Mughal Chronicles, especially the Akbar 5 AMA, have bequeathed a vision of empire in which agency rests almost solely with the emperor, while the rest of the kingdom has been portrayed as following his orders. Yet if we look more closely at the rich information these histories provide about the apparatus of the Mughal state, we may be able to understand the ways in which the imperial organization was dependent on several different institutions to be able to function effectively. One important pillar of the Mughal state was its core of officers, also referred to by historians collectively as the nobility. The nobility was recruited from diverse ethnic and religious groups. This ensured that no faction was large enough to challenge the authority of the state. The officer corps of the Mughals was described as a bouquet of flowers, Goldasta, held together by loyalty to the emperor. In Akbar's imperial service, Turani and Iranian nobles were present from the earliest phase of carving out a political dominion. Many had accompanied Humayun, others migrated later to the Mughal court. Two ruling groups of Indian origin entered the imperial service from 1560 onwards, the Rajputs and the Indian Muslims, Sheikhzadas. The first to join was a Rajput chief, Raja Bermalkishwaha of Amber, to whose daughter Akbar got married. Members of Hindu castes inclined towards education and accountancy were also promoted, a famous example being Akbar's finance minister, Raja Todar Mal, who belonged to the Khatri caste. Iranians gained high offices under Jahangir, whose politically influential queen, Nurjahan, d. 1645, was an Iranian. Aurangzeb appointed Rajputs to high positions, and under him the Marathas accounted for a sizable number within the body of officers. All holders of government offices held ranks, mansabs, comprising two numerical designations, Zat which was an indicator of position in the imperial hierarchy and the salary of the official, Mansabdar, and Sawar which indicated the number of horsemen he was required to maintain in service. In the 17th century, Mansabdars of 1000 Zat or above ranked as nobles, Dumara, which is the plural of Amir. The nobles participated in military campaigns with their armies and also served as officers of the empire in the provinces. Each military commander recruited, equipped, and trained the main striking arm of the Mughal army, the cavalry. The troopers maintained superior horses branded on the flank by the imperial mark, Dak. The emperor personally reviewed changes in rank, titles, and official postings for all except the low-stranked officers. 
Akbar, who designed the Mansab system, also established spiritual relationships with a select band of his nobility by treating them as his disciples, Murid. For members of the nobility, imperial service was a way of acquiring power, wealth, and the highest possible reputation. A person wishing to join the service petitioned through a noble, who presented a Tashwiz to the emperor. If the applicant was found suitable a mansab was granted to him. The Mir Bakshi, paymaster general, stood in open court on the right of the emperor and presented all candidates for appointment or promotion, while his office prepared orders bearing his seal and signature as well as those of the emperor. There were two other important ministers at the center, the Diwani Allah, finance minister, and Sadra Sujar, minister of grants or Madadi Mosh, and in charge of appointing local judges or qazis. The three ministers occasionally came together as an advisory body, but were independent of each other. Akbar with these and other advisors shaped the administrative, fiscal, and monetary institutions of the empire. Nobles stationed at the court, Tainati Rakab, were a reserve force to be deputed to a province or military campaign. They were duty-bound to appear twice daily, morning and evening, to express submission to the emperor in the public audience hall. They shared the responsibility for guarding the emperor and his household round the clock. 8.2 Information and Empire The keeping of exact and detailed records was a major concern of the Mughal administration. The Mir Bakshi supervised the corps of court writers, Wakianawis, who recorded all applications and documents presented to the court, and all imperial orders, Farman. In addition, agents, Wakil, of nobles and regional rulers recorded the entire proceedings of the court under the heading News from the Exalted Court, Akbaradi Darbari Mula, with the date and time of the court session, Pahar. The Akbarad contained all kinds of information such as attendance at the court, grant of offices and titles, diplomatic missions, presents received, or the inquiries made by the emperor about the health of an officer. This information is valuable for writing the history of the public and private lives of kings and nobles. News reports and important official documents traveled across the length and breadth of the regions under Mughal rule by imperial post. Round the clock relays of foot runners, Kassid or Pathamar, carried papers rolled up in bamboo containers. The emperor received reports from even distant provincial capitals within a few days. Agents of nobles posted outside the capital and Rajput princes and tributary rulers all assiduously copied these announcements and sent their contents by messenger back to their masters. The empire was connected by a surprisingly rapid information loop for public news. 8.3 Beyond the Center, Provincial Administration The division of functions established at the center was replicated in the provinces, subas, where they Ministers had their corresponding subordinates, Diwan, Bakshi, and Sadr. The head of the provincial administration was the governor, Subedar, who reported directly to the emperor. The Sarkars, into which each Suba was divided, often overlapped with the jurisdiction of Faujadars, commandants, who were deployed with contingents of heavy cavalry and musketeers in districts. The local administration was looked after at the level of the Pargana, Subdistrict, by three semi hereditary officers, the Kanungo, keeper of revenue records, the Shadhuri, in charge of revenue collection, and the Kazi. Each department of administration maintained a large support staff of clerks, accountants, auditors, messengers, and other functionaries who were technically qualified officials, functioning in accordance with standardized rules and procedures, and generating copious written orders and records. Persian was made the language of administration throughout, but local languages were used for village accounts. The Mughal chroniclers usually portrayed the emperor and his court as controlling the entire administrative apparatus down to the village level. Yet, as you have seen, this could hardly have been a process free of tension. The relationship between local landed magnates, the zamindars, and the representatives of the Mughal emperor was sometimes marked by conflicts over authority and a share of the resources. The zamindars often succeeded in mobilizing peasant support against the state. 9. Beyond the Frontiers Writers of chronicles list many high-sounding titles assumed by the Mughal emperors. 
These included general titles such as Shehen Shah, King of Kings, or specific titles assumed by individual kings upon ascending the throne, such as Jahangir, World Caesar, or Shah Jahan, King of the World. The chroniclers often drew on these titles and their meanings to reiterate the claims of the Mughal emperors to uncontested territorial and political control. Yet the same contemporary histories provide accounts of diplomatic relationships and conflicts with neighboring political powers. These reflect some tension and political rivalry arising from competing regional interests. 9.1 The Safavids and Kandahar the political and diplomatic relations between the Mughal kings and the neighboring countries of Iran and Turan hinged on the control of the frontier defined by the Hindu Kush mountains that separated Afghanistan from the regions of Iran and Central Asia. All conquerors who sought to make their way into the Indian subcontinent had to cross the Hindu Kush to have access to North India. A constant aim of Mughal policy was to ward off this potential danger by controlling strategic outposts notably Kabul and Kandahar. Kandahar was a bone of contention between the Safavids and the Mughals. The fortress town had initially been in the possession of Humayun, reconquered in 1595 by Akbar. While the Safavid court retained diplomatic relations with the Mughals, it continued to stake claims to Kandahar. In 1613 Jahangir sent a diplomatic envoy to the court of Shah Abbas to plead the Mughal case for retaining Kandahar but the mission failed. In the winter of 1622 a Persian army besieged Kandahar. The ill-prepared Mughal garrison was defeated and had to surrender the fortress and the city to the Safavids. 9.2 The Ottomans, Pilgrimage and Trade The relationship between the Mughals and the Ottomans was marked by the concern to ensure free movement for merchants and pilgrims in the territories under Ottoman control. This was especially true for the Hijaz, that part of Ottoman Arabia where the important pilgrim centers of Mecca and Medina were located. The Mughal emperor usually combined religion and commerce by exporting valuable merchandise to Aden and Makkah, both Red Sea ports, and distributing the proceeds of the sales in charity to the keepers of shrines and religious men there. However, when Aurangzeb discovered cases of misappropriation of funds sent to Arabia, he favored their distribution in India which, he thought, was as much a house of God as Mecca. 9.3 Jesuits at the Mughal court Europe received knowledge of India through the accounts of Jesuit missionaries, travelers, merchants, and diplomats. The Jesuit accounts are the earliest impressions of the Mughal court ever recorded by European writers. Following the discovery of a direct sea route to India at the end of the 15th century, Portuguese merchants established a network of trading stations in coastal cities. The Portuguese king was also interested in the propagation of Christianity with the help of the missionaries of the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. The Christian missions to India during the 16th century were part of this process of trade and empire building. Akbar was curious about Christianity and dispatched an embassy to Goa to invite Jesuit priests. The first Jesuit mission reached the Mughal court at Fatepur Sikri in 1580 and stayed for about two years. The Jesuits spoke to Akbar about Christianity and debated its virtues with the ulama. Two more missions were sent to the Mughal court at Lahore, in 1591 and 1595. The Jesuit accounts are based on personal observation and shed light on the character and mind of the emperor. At public assemblies the Jesuits were assigned places in close proximity to Akbar's throne. They accompanied him on his campaigns, tutored his children and were often companions of his leisure hours. The Jesuit accounts corroborate the information given in Persian chronicles about state officials and the general conditions of life in Mughal times. 10. Questioning Formal Religion The high respect shown by Akbar towards the members of the Jesuit mission impressed them deeply. They interpreted the emperor's open interest in the doctrines of Christianity as a sign of his acceptance of their faith. This can be understood in the light of the prevailing climate of religious intolerance in Western Europe. Montserrat remarked that the king cared little that in allowing everyone to follow his religion he was in reality violating all. Akbar's quest for religious knowledge led to interfaith debates in the Ibadat Kuna at Fatepur Sikri between learned Muslims, Hindus, Jainas, Parsis, and Christians. 
Akbar's religious views matured as he queried scholars of different religions and sects and gathered knowledge about their doctrines. Increasingly, he moved away from the orthodox Islamic ways of understanding religions towards a self-conceived eclectic form of divine worship focused on light and the sun. We have seen that Akbar and Abu al-Fazl created a philosophy of light and used it to shape the image of the king and ideology of the state. In this, a divinely inspired individual has supreme sovereignty over his people and complete control over his enemies. These ideas were in harmony with the perspective of the court chroniclers who give us a sense of the processes by which the Mughal rulers could effectively assimilate such a heterogeneous populace within an imperial edifice. The name of the dynasty continued to enjoy legitimacy in the subcontinent for a century and a half, even after its geographical extent and the political control it exercised had diminished considerably. Timeline Some Major Mughal Chronicles and Memoirs C. 1530 Manuscript of Babur's Memoirs in Turkish Saved from a Storm becomes part of the family collection of the Demurids. C. 1587 Gulbaddin Begum begins to write the Humayun 5 AMA. 1589 Babur's Memoirs translated into Persian as Babur 5 AMA. 1589 to 1602 Abu al Fazl works on the Akbar 5 AMA. 1605 to 1622 Jahangir writes his memoirs, the Jahangir 5 AMA. 1639 to 1647 Lahori composes the first two dafters of the Bad Shah 5 AMA. C. 1650 Muhammad Waris begins to chronicle the third decade of Shah Jahan's reign. 1668 Alamjir 5 AMA, a history of the first ten years of Aurangzeb's reign compiled by Muhammad Qasim. Chaktai Turks traced descent from the eldest son of Genghis Khan. The flight of the written word. In Abu al-Fajl's words, the written word may embody the wisdom of bygone ages and may become a means to intellectual progress. The spoken word goes to the heart of those who are present to hear it. The written word gives wisdom to those who are near and far. If it was not for the written word, the spoken word would soon die, and no keepsake would be left us from those who are passed away. Superficial observers see in the letter a dark figure, but the deep-sided see in it a lamp of wisdom, Chirag I say. The written word looks black, notwithstanding the thousand rays within it, or it is a light with a mole on it that wards off the evil eye. A letter, caught is the portrait of wisdom, a rough sketch from the realm of ideas, a dark light ushering in day, a black cloud pregnant with knowledge, speaking though dumb, stationary yet traveling, stretched on the sheet, and yet soaring upwards. Source 1. In praise of Taswir. Abu al-Fazl held the art of painting in high esteem. Drawing the likeness of anything is called Taswir. His Majesty from his earliest youth has shown a great predilection for this art, and gives it every encouragement, as he looks upon it as a means both of study and amusement. A very large number of painters have been set to work. Each week, several supervisors and clerks of the imperial workshop submit before the emperor the work done by each artist, and his majesty gives a reward and increases the monthly salaries of the artists according to the excellence displayed. Most excellent painters are now to be found, and masterpieces, worthy of a bilzad, may be placed at the site of the wonderful works of the European painters who have attained worldwide fame. The minuteness in detail, the general finish and the boldness of execution now observed in pictures are incomparable, even inanimate objects look as if they have life. More than a hundred painters have become famous masters of the art. This is especially true of the Hindu artists. Their pictures surpass our conception of things. Few, indeed, in the whole world are found equal to them. Why did Abu al-Fazl consider the art of painting important? How did he seek to legitimize this art? A diachronic account traces developments over time, whereas a synchronic account depicts one or several situations at one particular moment or point of time. Travels of the Badshah, AMA Gifting of precious manuscripts was an established diplomatic custom under the Mughals. In emulation of this, 
the Nawab of Awad gifted the illustrated Bad Shah 5 AMA to King George III in 1799. Since then it has been preserved in the English Royal Collections, now at Windsor Castle. In 1994, conservation work required the bound manuscript to be taken apart. This made it possible to exhibit the paintings, and in 1997 for the first time, the Bad Shah 5 AMA paintings were shown in exhibitions in New Delhi, London, and Washington. The Transmission of Notions of Luminosity the origins of Sarawardas philosophy went back to Plato's Republic, where God is represented by the symbol of the sun. Sarawardas writings were universally read in the Islamic world. They were studied by Sheikh Mubarak, who transmitted their ideas to his sons, Faizi and Abu al-Fazl, who were trained under him. Figure 9.5 This painting by Abu al-Hasan shows Jahangir dressed in resplendent clothes and jewels, holding up a portrait of his father Akbar. Akbar is dressed in white, associated in Sufi traditions with the enlightened soul. He proffers a globe, symbolic of dynastic authority. In the Mughal Empire there was no law laying down which of the emperor's sons would succeed to the throne. This meant that every dynastic change was accompanied and decided by a fratricidal war. Towards the end of Akbar's reign, Prince Salim revolted against his father, seized power, and assumed the title of Jahangir. Figure 9.7 Jahangir shooting the figure of poverty, painting by the artist Abu El Hassan. The artist has enveloped the target in a dark cloud to suggest that this is not a real person, but a human form used to symbolize an abstract quality. Such a mode of personification in art and literature is termed allegory. The chain of justice is shown descending from heaven. This is how Jahangir described the chain of justice in his memoirs. After my accession, the first order that I gave was for the fastening up of the chain of justice, so that if those engaged in the administration of justice should delay or practice hypocrisy in the matter of those seeking justice, the oppressed might come to this chain and shake it so that its noise might attract attention. The chain was made of pure gold. 30 gaz in length and containing 60 bells. Axis mundi is a Latin phrase for a pillar or pole that is visualized as the support of the earth. Cornish was a form of ceremonial salutation in which the courtier placed the palm of his right hand against his forehead and bent his head. It suggested that the subject placed his head the seat of the senses and the mind into the hand of humility, presenting it to the royal assembly. Source 2. Darbari Akbari. Abu al-Fazl gives a vivid account of Akbar's Darbar. Whenever His Majesty, Akbar, holds court, Darbar, a large drum is beaten, the sounds of which are accompanied by divine praise. In this manner, people of all classes receive notice. His Majesty's sons and grandchildren, the grandees of the court, and all other men who have admittance, attend to make the Cornish, and remain standing in their proper places. Learned men of renown and skillful mechanics pay their respects, and the officers of justice present their reports. His Majesty, with his usual insights, gives orders and settles everything in a satisfactory manner. During the whole time, skillful gladiators and wrestlers from all countries hold themselves in readiness, and singers, male and female, are in waiting. Clever jugglers and funny tumblers also are anxious to exhibit their dexterity and agility. Chahar Taslim is a mode of salutation which begins with placing the back of the right hand on the ground, and raising it gently till the person stands erect, when he puts the palm of his hand upon the crown of his head. It is done for, Chahar, times. Taslim literally means submission. Shabai Barat is the full moon night on the 14 Shaban, the eighth month of the Hijri calendar, and is celebrated with prayers and fireworks in the subcontinent. It is the night when the destinies of the Muslims for the coming year are said to be determined and sins forgiven. The Jeweled Throne This is how Shah Jahan's jeweled throne, Takti Murasa, in the Hall of Public Audience in the Agra Palace is described in the Bad Shah 5 AMA. This gorgeous structure has a canopy supported by 12-sided pillars and measures 5 cubits in height from the flight of steps to the overhanging dome. On His Majesty's coronation, he had commanded that 86 lakh worth of gems and precious stones, and 1 lakh tolas of gold worth another 14 lakh, 
should be used in decorating it. The throne was completed in the course of seven years, and among the precious stones used upon it was a ruby worth one lakh of rupees that Shah Abbas Saifavi had sent to the late Emperor Jahangir. And on this ruby were inscribed the names of the great Emperor Timur Sahabai Kiran, Mirza Sharuk, Mirza Ulub Beg, and Shah Abbas as well as the names of the Emperors Akbar, Jahangir, and that of His Majesty himself. Figure